Okay, as we have a quorum, call the meeting to order. Um, apologies have been received from uh, Deputy Harty and Deputy Canny. Um, before we go any further, to remind you about the mobile phones, either switch them off or to flight mode, and not just because of the interference that causes the meeting, but because the proceedings are both being relayed and broadcast and recorded, and they interfere with that. Uh, in accordance with standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedures and Privileges for paperless committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. I propose that we go into private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Thank you. We're now in public session. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, Witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements submitted by the committee to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the House or an, or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'd like to welcome the Construction Industry Federation, um, represented this morning by uh, Tom Parlin, Director General, uh, Mr Hugh O'Neill, Mr Anthony Neville, Mr Hubert Fitzpatrick and Mr Shane Dempsey. You're all very welcome. Um, I understand you're going to make a, a short opening statement and we'll then take questions from the members of the committee. Thank you for your attendance today. Right. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the committee. And uh, first of all, I want to say we're very happy to be here uh, to assist, I hope, uh, the committee, because I know that you have a fairly tight deadline and that you have to come up with recommendations uh, in, in, in a fairly short period. Um, the two gentlemen on my left here are actual members of the CIF, uh, and they're both house builders. So from that point of view, I think they'll bring quite a bit of experience and hopefully, uh, you know, in the questions and answers. Uh, my, my two colleagues on my, on my right-hand side here are the, the, the executives uh, who, work, who work with me. Um, I suppose we, we represent the builders who have the skills and the capacity to build the houses, um, and hopefully, you know, we can bring that perspective to the committee. I think at the outset in terms of house building as being part of the overall construction industry federation, it has now become a lesser part, but still a very substantial part. And the industry actually in, 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 in overall capacity is actually growing and is recovering. Um, has quite a bit to go before it is deemed to be at sort of the normal optimum level. Uh, but CSO figures would show that we're, we're increasing the workforce by about a thousand uh, construction workers per month uh, recently. Unfortunately, it hasn't materialised uh, in the, in the uh, residential side, so that's uh, we're here to address. Uh, I've read the transcripts of the other um, uh, participants so far, and uh, we would say that supply is the real problem, the lack of supply. I know some other people have suggested it was management of the supply we have, but uh, I think there's no question about it that um, <coughs> supply is a major part of the problem. And uh, the large problem that the industry have is the cost of production, the cost of, uh, the cost of, of, of construction, uh, as against the affordable cost as to what the market is in a position to offer at the moment. And uh, the presentation goes into quite a bit of detail about that. Um, we also feel there's a need for very substantial infrastructure investment. Uh, we can't just build 10 or 25,000 houses with substanti without substantial uh, infrastructure investment, be it in the road structure, in the water and wastewater, uh, and even in terms of schools for new communities and so on. And we know there's been quite a bit of debate lately about a minister for infrastructure uh, and construction or a minister for housing, we certainly feel that it's imperative that somebody has overall responsibility. And uh, we know that uh, the current acting minister referred uh, uh, to the levers that need to be pulled. Uh, and if you don't have access to all of the levers, the, the, the issues, and certainly appreciate it, probably difficult for one minister to have access. But if there's somebody who is 
determined responsibility by the Taoiseach or by the Cabinet be a very senior civil servant that can lift the phone or pull the lever that is holding up. We think that's, uh, that's imperative. Um, as I said, the, the issue of housing supply, certainly it, is, uh, it has the ultimate knock-on to the homelessness uh, issue that's out there. Um, the availability of adequate mortgages uh, for some borrowers certainly is a major issue, and uh, assembling the required deposit is certainly a major challenge to a lot of people who are currently attempting to get onto the housing uh, ladder. So we feel that if a number of those issues are addressed, that it will stimulate new housing, uh, house building. And, um, by doing so, uh, the level of direct uh, social housing provision, you know, I think that will certain, certainly assist those persons as well. And there's a lot of people who are just on the margins of being able to draw down their mortgage and provide their own housing. And uh, while we agree absolutely with uh, the central bank uh, uh, applying restrictions, we feel that some minor tweaking uh, of those particular restrictions <coughs> will allow people that are on the margins to, to qualify for mortgages without... without um, uh, 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 having a negative impact on their repayment capacity. So we have submitted a fairly substantial uh, uh, um, and detailed uh, submission. I'll just give a brief run through. We have been proposing for a while a help to buy scheme and you know this would be a direct help to the first time buyers. Uh, it has been happening in the UK for quite a long while uh, with very very good effect in terms of the number of houses turned out and basically it means that the uh, state or the government will take a stake, uh, an equity stake in the loans up to a maximum of 25%. So it means that somebody who's attempting to buy a house for 300,000, 300, that the stake would take, state would take a 20% maximum, that would be 60%, and that that would be repayable back over a period of five years. So it makes the, uh, the jump, uh, you know, uh, it makes the uh, challenge of getting the mortgage, of putting the deposit together uh, quite a bit easier and uh, we feel that that certainly would certainly assist uh, in terms of encouraging the supply. Uh, as I said, getting the mortgages together has been a challenge. We're suggesting a tax incentivised savings scheme for purchases of, of first new, new, new houses. Uh, it could be very restricted to people who are only, absolutely only, who are saving for deposit. And, uh, you know, it certainly uh, would be an incentive. And we're suggesting that uh, up to a 25% contribution by the Exchequer for every euro saved uh, would be the means. The local or the, the, the development levies are quite a substantial cost uh, upon the industry and as a result a cost upon the first time buyers. Uh, and we can understand why they were uh, introduced originally because the infrastructure investment had to be made. But now we have local property tax uh, and we had water charges until fairly recently anyhow. And, um, uh, it's a double taxation, so we believe that the local property tax should be developed uh, in a su sufficient way that it will provide for the infrastructure and that the levies uh, would be dropped. Um, that has been an issue that has been raised and we know that a number of people have uh, accepted, which is the case, that 36% uh, of the cost of the first-time buyer uh, goes to the Exchequer. VAT is certainly one of those costs. Um, and a reduction of the VAT that has been proposed by ourselves and by a number of other players from the 13.5% to 9% would reduce the overall cost of the first time 300,000 house uh, by close on 12,000 euros. Um, now, I know there's been different debates and suggestions, you know, how can you be sure that that will pass on to the first time buyer and so on. And certainly that's something that we'd like to address. And I know that one of our members here has said currently uh, in the houses that he's selling that if there's any change in VAT, it will be reflected in the price. So, you know, the industry don't want to be in that situation where we'd be accused or seen to, you know, just line the pockets with that. But currently, in terms of working out a viable uh, uh, proposal to your lender, and certainly most uh, and practically all builders would have to acquire finance at the moment. And it's not just from the banks because they'll come up with a maximum of 60% and that's a very dysfunctional market at the moment. But in terms of the other financiers that might come on board, unless you have a viable plan and unless you can show that you're making a margin, um, uh, you're not going to do it. And I think uh, certainly the VAT as, as opposed to the levies and so on offers a, 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 a an opportunity, I think, to bridge that gap. And we're saying that it should be, it should be uh, 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 targeted and it should be time-specific. 
in terms of any concern that if there was a change now that it would lead on to some uh, further uh, more difficult developments into the future. We're proposing changes to the seven-year capital gains tax exemption. It was uh, put in place for very, very, very good reason, but an, an unintended consequence which arises in lots of cases that uh, there's now no, no requirement to develop that land uh, during the relevant period. Uh, so we're proposing some changes there. Uh, the central bank review um, you know, just currently, a 300,000 mortgage, you need a deposit of 38,000 and you need an annual income, combined annual income of 75,000. Unfortunately, that's, you know, going to accommodate a very small percentage of the potential house buyers. It doesn't take any account of the fact that those first-time buyers are substantially older than they might have been previously, maybe five or six years older, have a family, and in most cases are renting and could be paying up to 20,000 a year for rent. It doesn't take that into account. So we are proposing some modifications there uh, that will lessen those requirements. And still we think that um, you know, the banking sector can be satisfied and would have to satisfy themselves with the uh, repayment capacity of the people. On the social housing side, we're pr proposing a number of different areas, and we know that you've had a number of players in already, certainly to review the land bank retained by the housing agency and the local authorities where, uh, and the access to its immediate suitability for general housing construction. Uh, we feel, and we know lots of commentators are saying, within the M50 there is lots and lots and lots of land, uh, and certainly that has to be reviewed, and we know that we have to work out what is available, shovel ready and so on, and make that available. Um, Part 5 contributions, you know, is an issue that has been raised time and time again. We absolutely support, and the industry wants to support, uh, a contribution to social housing. Uh, we feel that the Part 5, particularly when there's little or no housing done, it made a very, very minute contribution. And we feel now that if we are to sort of ramp it up, uh, that that Part 5 contribution passes on, just like all the other costs, onto the first-time buyer. And we have proposed all along that instead of the Part 5 social housing contribution, that it should be a 1% levy on all residential transactions. And uh, the figures that we have presented here would show that it would bring in substantially more um, than uh, is currently the case. In terms of uh, urban uh, regeneration, uh, and particularly we're talking about uh, rural towns, uh, there is a lot of capacity and a lot of rural towns uh, and a lot of derelict sites uh, certainly um, you know, uh, are falling into disrepair and we're proposing some uh, incentives there uh, that would encourage the people that own those sites to turn them into good quality living accommodation in towns where it suits people to live and suits families to live and so on and, and that would make the, the upgrading more financially viable. The last point I'm going to raise, Chairman, is the Register of Builders, um, the Construction Industry Register of Ireland. Uh, it was accepted by the outgoing government uh, Action 55 to uh, provide uh, on a statutory basis the register uh, for contractors and builders and tradespersons. And the register would mean that the, uh, that the customer whether it be a housing agency or an individual or a local authority or whoever, when they engage a contractor that's on the register, that they're assured they're going to get a competent contractor that is going to be fully compliant tax-wise, uh, health and safety-wise, insurance-wise and so on, and get rid of some of the issues that unfortunately brought ill repute upon the industry where non-professionals were involved uh, and took advantage of uh, loopholes and so on. And this is something that the industry absolutely supports. There's a voluntary register in place at the moment. There's over 850 members or 850 uh, 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 people uh, registered. But we certainly feel that hopefully in the, uh, the, the attempts and the, the efforts by the industry to solve this particular problem in terms of getting the output, that the work will be done by uh, competent uh, uh, professionals into the future. So I leave it at that, Chairman. Uh, my colleagues here will be uh, uh, very uh, anxious to try and answer any questions that are put forward, and we look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Parlin. I'd just like to start the questions along the line. You clearly indicated from your opening uh, comments uh, that the cost of housing, uh, taken in context with the central bank uh, guidelines, is an issue, and, and during your presentation, you referred to the issue of VAT and development levies and so forth. I suppose it would be remiss of the committee uh, not to ask you directly, the costs that the uh, construction industry have direct control over, 
what savings, if any, can be made in that particular area? Because you, you obviously pointed out other areas, yeah. but your own area that of you course, have control and I accept over. That is, and it's a very valid question. The, um, the chartered surveyors have come forward with a, with, with, with a number of, of um, costings recently, and one that I think is about to be publicised very, very soon. That would suggest that if your typical 300,000 starter home in Dublin, that the actual construction costs are about 150,000, about half of the end cost. Um, after you've constructed it, you obviously have to provide for the site, the VAT, the levies, the Part 5 contribution and so on. Um, so currently it's about half. Um, in terms of the cost, and I did see a presentation uh, suggesting that if you had the economies of scale and if we were to build 500 units, and that would be fine and dandy, but it's hard set to build five at the moment in terms of the, the difficulties that are out there. Uh, and I've, you know, I think the industry would would face up to that challenge, economies of scale. Um, the industry overall, would say, are fulfilling massive projects at the moment. I'll just name two within fairly close proximity to Dublin. The Facebook are doing a data centre out in Clonee County Mead that is close on a billion euros worth. In terms of the efficiencies uh, that are brought in there, are absolutely world class. And whether it be lean construction or uh, BIM or all of the modern stuff that you know brings more efficiencies, that's what our members are obliged and are forced to do and are embracing. And likewise, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb building a fabulous new new facility to build one of the most uh, advanced cancer drugs uh, in the world. And likewise, you know, so if the opportunity is there, the house building industry, I think, will step into that mark. But because of the lack of scale. Uh, we know that there's massive pressure around at the moment for uh, an, on the wage side. Uh, we believe we pay a very substantial wage. We're in engagement with the unions at this stage. Um, but there isn't certainly much scope to reduce the cost of uh, labour on sites. We don't see that. It is a very labour-intensive industry. Um, the the 10,000 houses that we would like to build extra and that most of the commentators are saying would provide 25,000 jobs. On terms of the other materials, a lot of, not a lot of scope. If there's increased demand, you know, there is pressure there. I think the industry certainly will want to face up to finding efficiencies there, but we don't genuinely see there's a lot of scope to reduce the actual build cost. And if you compare our hard building costs uh, internationally, we're very much in line uh, with, with what is the norm around, around Europe at the moment. Just for my own information, on a 300,000 euro house, you indicated that the construction cost was about 150. What's the breakdown of that 150 between uh, materials and wages? You were to do, maybe Just roughly. Uh, well, if we look at the, the labour involved in building a house, it's normally about one and a half direct jobs or two and a half jobs direct and indirect per annum. So if you factor that into it, that, would, that should give a reasonable breakdown between labour labor and materials. One point just that I might, might make in terms of looking at the hard construction costs. We looked at the hard construction costs of a house here compared to the UK. And on a per square, square footage basis, the hard construction costs in Ireland were on par with those pertaining in the UK. But the difference related to the size of house here compared to the UK, the house sizes in the UK are generally 20% smaller than they are here. And then it is the other soft costs which are out of line with those pertaining in the UK. Because in the UK, you have a 0% VAT rate and you've, you wouldn't have the same extent of development levies and, levies and so forth. So we were, we were anxious to address this issue back back over the over the last over the last 12 to 18 months, and we feel happy that look at the hard construction costs are broadly online on a per square footage basis, but it's the other related issues that are causing the difficulties, including actually size. Okay, thank you, members. Yeah. Deputy Dirk, uh, Chairman, <coughs> I welcome Mr. Powell and his colleagues, and <coughs> and uh, just a couple of questions. The thing that intrigues me most is the, the, the 300,000 uh, euro starter house and the ability of the average uh, loan applicant to be able to service a loan. Now, to, from my, to my knowledge, and we, as you know, uh, Mr Chairman, are supposed to be well paid, I wouldn't be able to, to service that kind of a loan and I, I wouldn't be able to come from a starter house and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the exception. So what I, what I am and want to inquire about is, at the moment, in, in your calculations, what, what regard has there been had for the, 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 the various costs, I accept, by the way, the, the, the VAT and, and the taxes being one third of the total uh, cost of the house, I accept that, and has crept up gradually to such an extent that it's virtually impossible. What I saw 
as being the biggest contributor to inflation in house prices were two things. A, the speculation that went on within the land sector. In other words, a person acquiring a plot of land or plots of land or control over a multiplicity of plots of land and using that as a lever uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, in, to enhance their own profits. There have been countless instances of this, and I, I note what you say about the capital uh, acquisition tax and capital gains tax and all this kind of thing. They should actually kick in to, to, to remove those problems, but apparently they don't. The problem now is facing us is this, is that over a, a, a seven or eight year period, uh, house prices increased by something in the region of 500 per cent, thereabouts, thereabouts, roughly thereabouts. Uh, and that's intolerable. And I know that the availability of unlimited funds was a contributory factor. But what about the, the, the speculation that took place where a person acquired a property or properties or a multiplicity of properties and offloaded them after six or eight months to somebody else at a massive profit, who in turn offloaded to somebody else at again a massive profit? And can I ask this question now? Arising from that period, what amount of land likely to become available to the construction sector for the public and the private sector is likely to be affected by the prices, that be, the inflated prices uh, that, that prevailed during the boom? In other words, are we, are we, are we, are we using as a benchmark now uh, the prices uh, reduced somewhat but still having their roots fixed in the boom period? Uh, in, other, in other words, that whereby some people who have speculated wrongly and unwisely or otherwise uh, that they might, uh, they might see themselves in a position of, of maybe recovering some of their ground. We're not in the position, where, to my mind, our job is not to, to facilitate that. Our job is to facilitate the customer, who is, whether it be the building sector or, 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 the, or the consumer, we need to do that as the first option. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Uh, Mr. Parlin, if you hold for a moment, I'll take two or three questions uh, together. <coughs> Deputy O'Dowd. Um, I just want to say that I uh, welcome the CIF here. I think that uh, we all have a lot of ground to make up in society, politicians, and indeed the CIF. And it just brings to mind of two houses side by side in a recent election. One was bought for 750,000. Uh, the neighbour beside it, the exact same house, paid uh, half of that. So there's been huge speculation, and indeed the, the good name of the builder you know, uh, it, you know it's, it's a very difficult name to stand over in many parts of our country uh, because of the exploitation and the profiteering that took place. Uh, and what we all have to do, including politicians and, and the industry, is to step up to the mark. And I would be concerned that uh, I would have liked to have seen a lot more constructive suggestions, Mr. Parlin, from your association here. I welcome the points you make, and I'm not being critical of those. But I think we'd like to hear more from you about what more you can do as an organisation uh, to reduce costs yourselves and to make housing more affordable. But the two questions I have for you are basically one is that you have an awful lot of either uh, properties in town centres which are over shops and over businesses which are unoccupied. And uh, notwithstanding the issues that might arise, would you be, it seems to me that would be a constructive thing to have a scheme whereby you could actually make them suitable for, for modern flats or residences for people who would have the family type that could live there. I'm talking about maybe childless couples or single people or whatever. Uh, there's also a lot of infill sites in local authorities, in the ownership of local authorities, um, which I believe if the councils identify them, that the, we ought to be able to reach a, a satisfactory solution that they could offer them as service sites to builders competitively uh, to build on. And that would get over a lot of the infrastructure costs that, that you're actually talking about. And the last point I want to make, uh, which is something which I think was the Affordable Homes Partnership, I think some years ago, we're looking at a place like Gormanstown Army Camp, where there's over 200 acres. And if you were to take, say, 60 acres of that land, uh, and if that were serviced by the state, I'm talking about uh, you know, we have to get the vehicle which other members have spoken about, a special purpose vehicle or whatever, whether it be NAMA, whoever it is, that we could offer service sites, serviced by 
you know, by, by the state in terms of the, you know, the special infrastructure funds or whatever, to builders at a competitive uh, fixed price environment. In other words, it would do away with the issues that you have as an organisation as regards the cost of infrastructure. The state has an obligation to support social and affordable housing, I believe. And is there a formula that we could find uh, nationally or regionally, or even I think it probably would require a bigger organisation than the county council to get it right, but we could immediately move on sites that are owned either A, by local authorities, or B, by the state or semi-state bodies uh, that could be used immediately, immediately for housing. And I would like your views on that. I'll take one more and in this section. Uh, Deputy Coppinger, please. Thanks, um, Chair. Um, the first question is just what's the uh, CIF's view on the report at the weekend in the Sunday Business Post that NAMA has allowed 80 major property developers walk away from one and a half billion worth <clears throat> of toxic debt. The write-off is equivalent per developer to 19 million. And I'm just wondering how the CIF feels. Is that just, uh, have you any views on it, given ordinary mo mortgage holders are, are still being screwed to pay for inflated house prices? But yet, members of yours, and maybe they're not all members of yours, are being allowed to walk away from their debts. But the, I just wanted to deal with what you raised in your submission. Um, so my substantive question is, how much profit is enough profit for a builder to build? Um, for example, on a house selling this famous starter home that everyone's talking about for 300,000, which doesn't seem much like a starter home, if you consider the income you need to buy that. Um, how much profit would you be happy with on a house like that? Because the CEO of NAMA has said that it's profitable to build houses. It's a question of how much profit people want to make. And he suggested that builders weren't happy with profits of 20,000 per house, and they were waiting till the profits reached 50,000 or more. That's the CEO of NAMA. Now, you've come here today looking for a range of breaks and incentives. You want abolition of the Part 5. You want abolition of development levies and for ordinary people to pay more property tax. You want to reintroduce the tax breaks that benefited high-income earners in the main, and the Department of Finance found that, and also led to the empty houses all in Leitrim. You want to introduce a help-to-buy scheme, as in Britain, which has turned out to be a help-to-sell scheme. And you want tax incentives for new buyers, many of whom are able to save anyway, and they're not really the focus of, of this committee, if you like. But given those two features, that it isn't it fair to deduce that the developers in this country, your members, are on strike? And they're holding the country to ransom until they get these concessions from government. And if that was any group of workers in this country, they'd be slated every day in the media. So why is it that the developers in the construction industry are allowed to hold off until it's profitable enough for them and ask the government to cave in and give a rake of concessions to get them to do what they're meant to be doing? Thank you, Deputy. Mr. Parlin, you've had a, a number of questions Very good. there. I see our, our submission didn't have much impact on Deputy Coppinger. Any, uh, um, first of all, I'll deal with uh, Deputy uh, Durkin. Uh, I think you're right about the speculation of land in the past. It did drive actual site prices out of control, and that led largely to the, 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 the crazy prices uh, uh, that were made. It isn't the case now. Like this 300,000, and we only refer to the 300,000 house because that is sort of the going price. The new type of house that you'll get now with the new building regulations uh, and so on is a superb quality house in terms of the, the finish. It is a very, very good product. And there's an assigned certifier system that it has to be uh, written, signed off by a chartered surveyor, a chartered uh, uh, building, uh, a chartered uh, uh, engineer, or an architect. So that adds substantially to the quality of the house, it adds substantially to the cost. Uh, but that particular house, uh, members will tell me, and we can see from the figures in the chartered surveyors, 30,000 is the ex absolute maximum that you can put in for that particular site. So if some investor, and we know a lot of the big funds have come in, and we see the different project this and project that and project the other, massive uh, numbers of sites being sold off to developers. When you, when you divide 
uh, the actual number of sites uh, by the actual overall price. You know, those individual sites can range from between 20 to 150,000 each. Now, if you're in some areas, and I think there was a, a, a contribution to this committee already saying, suggesting, I think it was in Clontarf, uh, where a development was sold there of sites, and I'm not sure, Chairman, was it 120 or 140,000 a site? Now, we say location, 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 uh, but if somebody chooses to build or to buy a site for 120,000, uh, you need to get a very, very big markup on the actual build price. Um, so I don't think that can happen anymore, and certainly we don't. And there's been suggestions about how to curb uh, hoarding of sites and how to encourage people that have sitting on those sites to offload them. Um, and certainly we would favour uh, such developments generally, but we would point out that the reason that a number of sites are not being developed is not because somebody is sitting on them, or as, as Deputy Coppinger says, that the, that the individual is on strike. It means that either there is a planning issue, there is a, a, a um, financial issue in terms of not being able to afford or not being able to draw down the finances to develop it, or very more likely uh, there is a, a, um, an infrastructure issue in that there isn't a water supply, uh, there isn't a wastewater supply, or there isn't a road access to the sites. So, you know, that was the past. I don't think we're going to see that in the future. And certainly the people we represent, and I didn't see the article that you referred to yesterday uh, in the Sunday Business Post, but I suspect uh, that a lot of developers and speculators, we represent the, the people who build, who take the risks on employing people and, and, and buying the plant and, and getting out and getting their hands dirty every day. Those are the people we represent, not the, not the speculators. Some of the builders in the past did become speculators, and unfortunately to their great grief in that may, they may well be some of the people that you mentioned that, that, uh, in the article. Um, in terms of Deputy O'Dowd, certainly we feel the industry, we have ground to make up, just like uh, you say, like politicians have to do, and that's why we're so much in favour of the register that the register will exclude cowboys from the industry. It will only include professionals who are, know their business, who are competent, who are tax compliant, and who meet all of the other very, very strict criteria that, that are involved in building at the moment. Um, the properties in the town centres, I'd just ask Hubert, because Hubert has a very, very uh, uh, specific proposal on that. Uh, certainly, uh, there is scope in all towns, both in, in the cities, and some efforts have been made to encourage those. But in, in country towns, I know, uh, even though I'm an awfully man, my local town is Ross Grey, and Castle Street used to be a thriving street with a hotel and a couple of banks and pubs and so on. If you drive up at 11 o'clock at night now, you might see three cars and, 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 and every place closed. So there's certainly a scope there. There has to be a lot of space uh, in that particular street in Ross Grey to accommodate people. Uh, and uh, people probably need some bit of an incentive to go ahead and invest in it. I'll just refer, before I ask Uber to come in on that, just to Deputy uh, Coppinger. Uh, I have no idea who these developers are. And certainly, I, knowing from my experience of NAMA that if they've, been have, if they've been signed off, it's because of nothing left to get. My experience of NAMA have done a very, very effective uh, job at certainly working out to the best effect uh, with people. Uh, to maximise whatever assets to have less and, and maximise the return that they can make. Um, you asked the question about how much profit is enough, and you again, I heard uh, uh, the CEO of NAMA being uh, quoted. Uh, I uh, contradicted that particular statement at the time, and I think NAMA would suggest now that it isn't the case, because you only have to look at the CEO. There isn't. Uh, a margin at the moment is whatever you might have left over, not that there's a 20,000 margin. The banks would be looking for a 15% margin. Uh, NAMA, I think, uh, factor in a 15% margin for the builder, uh, where they are uh, joint venturing and when they are financially supporting uh, some of their clients uh, to build out, and there's a substantial amount of that going on. So the notion that a builder wouldn't build for 20,000, I can guarantee you, Deputy, any builder and the two gentlemen here, I'd say, would take your hand off or anyone else's hand off if there was a notion that there was a 20,000 margin in building a, a, a 300,000 house. It certainly isn't the case at the moment. Um, in terms of developers being on strike, thankfully, builders are finding other work than building houses at the moment because it is uneconomically viable to build a house at the moment, in most cases. And maybe either the gentleman here would like to get into some of the detail. But builders are doing, if you walk around the city of Dublin, you see massive refurbishment going on everywhere. So builders are becoming subcontractors, they're getting out and they're specialising in some other works. But the standard house building, that most of this, the small family builders would have been engaged in, that is unviable for them at the moment, at the current sort of prices, at the costs that they have to incur and at the, at the prices that are. So there's no suggestion. Maybe the developers are on strike. 
maybe they can afford to be on strike, maybe they have some money left over from the crash, but the builders that we represent, uh, certainly a lot of them are still underemployed, and that's the one point I would make in terms of any concern. There is capacity still. We are concerned that uh, a big pickup in activity will lead to a skill shortage, and we're dealing with education and with SOLAS and with a number of different agencies on that, because we know there's still a lot of people on the live register that have some uh, construction uh, skills but need them upgraded before they would be fit to go back on site again. And that's a, that's a, a problem that we'd look forward to having. But currently, there isn't a skill shortage. Currently, there is capacity. And in terms of the house builders and the, the general main contractors, we know that some of the bigger schemes will involve uh, main contractors that will be tendered and so on. And I've come across one of our members lately uh, who's, who's uh, doing a, a substantial scheme of 100 houses plus, And he's operating on a margin of just over 2%. And I think any businessman looking at it would say that's a margin that is way too tight uh, to guarantee uh, you're going to get a return at all. But such is the tightness of the margin, such is the comp com competition in the business that the margins are that low. And to suggest that builders wouldn't build for a 60,000 margin is ridiculous. And I think you should ask uh, the CEO again if that's the, the view that he holds, because it can be used in lots of cases to throw it and have a go at builders. It isn't the case. I can guarantee it isn't the case. Um, Mr Fitzpatrick. Ch Chairman, in, in many parts of the country, the sales prices of existing stock is way, way below replacement cost. In that, you know, you can buy houses in many parts of the country at the moment for perhaps 70, 60, 70 percent of the build cost of those units. And that is a major problem because it is not viable to secure finance to go in and build any units in those, in those areas. So that clearly has to be addressed. With regard to Deputy Dowd's suggestion there about uh, the various infill sites, yes, I think that there, there is significant scope for rejuven rejuvenating those, those particular sites. Um, you know, there may be some constraints to developing those sites. There may be issues in relation to building regulations uh, that pertain to living over the shop areas and so on. And we would suggest that the building regulation should be looked at to ensure is there some way they could be tweaked to ensure that you can make that development viable and at the same time ensure you're building buildings that are fit for purpose and, and, and satisfy all, all, all needs. Um, the, the regional nature of the market cannot, cannot be over overemphasised because yeah, you have some development taking place in Dublin and Cork and Little and Galway, but after that it's, for, it's, it's very, very sparse and there's very little done. But I, I would say that uh, the industry wants to get out there and build houses, but because the, if the costs are higher than sales prices, it's just not, it's just not viable to do it. Thank you. Deputy Cowan. Thanks, Chairman. Apologies for being late, but that's it. See, for coming forward and making the presentation, I, I read it earlier, so, you know, we'd be on the same page in many aspects of it in relation to the savings schemes, in relation to recognition for those that are renting properties and um, give, being given some credit in relation to the review that the central bank would have on deposits. In relation to the land banks, you know, and the audit of them and the potential for development, I would ask that, you know, your opinion in relation to joint ventures that may uh, be possible with local authorities and maybe, you know, the incentive for that in the first instance in relation to the VAT refund the reduction of the VAT might be something to explore. Um, you will be on the same page in relation to town renewal and regeneration schemes. Um, have you any suggestions or, 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 or legal opinion in relation to the CPO legislation and its potential for exploration there, where local authorities could take the lead? Um, you know, again, I wouldn't agree totally with your, the, the way in which you, you you seek to revise the development levies. You know, I think that's to be a holistic approach that needs to be taken across the country, and I think um, you know, government have a role to play in, in, in realising that wish. The two questions I have, you know, I also, by the way, you know, I disagree with you in relation to Part Five. I think if we can, across the whole uh, construction sector, seek to help and assist uh, private development and public development, and address the issue in relation to. Uh, rental and mortgage distress and so forth, that there's a holistic approach that will improve the lot of the social dividend for the state. And I think, you know, having played our part in revising that, 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 that sector, that there should be a return on that investment in relation to Part 5, and I would like to see the 20% restored, not alone the, the 10%, but I, I hear where you're coming from and I respect where you're coming from, but obviously if there's improvements, there has to be a, a 
benefit derived by the state. Uh, the two questions I have in relation to certification and compliance costs. I don't think you, you refer to this in your submission. And I know, for example, it's been said that the you know it's costing up to twenty thousand for an apartment in Dublin. Uh, the costs have been exacerbated in recent years with the new uh, regulations that have come into force. And would you be interested in a you know in a license system that was specifically dedicated uh, towards that area? You know, maybe supervised and managed and, and, and policed by local authorities. Uh, would you have a, a view on that? And also in relation to the availability of funds. You know, I don't think you mentioned that in your presentation, but that is one of the major stumbling blocks to, to, to the development taking place at present, and the, 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 the lack of available funds from, from institutions. And um, you know, the government initiated a scheme together with some American funds, where the government invested 125 compared to 375, a 500 million fund. Um, what rate has been paid by your members, or been asked to be paid by your members? And how does it compare to the mezzanine funds, again, which are uh, far superior, far greater than, than one would expect? And um, would you be open to, you know, strategic investment funds be put in place in order to help and assist the sector at more competitive rates than, than is the case there? I, I am sure you would agree with me in saying that if rates of 15 and 16 percent are being charged, uh, that that has to be uh, put, a, put a stop to, and we have to think again and put in place more realistic uh, proposals that can help and assist the industry. Thank you, Deputy.